very good evening and a warm welcome to all the doctors present here team clinic is very proud to be a part of this webinar as a digital partner so without further delay i would like to welcome dr muralidha kanji sir who is a dean of ica to hand over the session so over to you for the next proceedings good evening and uh, good morning wherever you are from i am speaking to you from bangalore india it's my proud privilege and honor to invite you to this 95th webinar of the indian college of anesthesiologists the wednesday webinars being conducted by ica that is indian college of anesthesiologists has almost become a landmark event in the history of uh, anesthesia in india and uh, we will be having three to four modules on mechanical ventilation in the starting from this webinar in the next few weeks we will be rolling out the other modules and at this juncture i would like to announce the 100th ica webinar on the 15th of june 15th of june we are going to have the 100th ica webinar just remember that and join us and celebrate along with us with this few words i would like to uh, invite my panelists and moderators for the evening they are all accomplished anesthesiologists first i would like to introduce jacob vargis dr jacob vargis is the uh, senior consultant at rajagiri hospital in kochi and next one i would like to introduce dr ratan gupta who is a senior consultant cardiac critical care uh, expert from narayan hrudayalaya next one i would like to introduce dr anup kumar who is the chief of critical care medicine in the baby memorial hospital calicut kerala and uh, dr raghunath he is the consultant in intensive at the ggsm hospital mysore all the panelists are experienced and uh, i request you to post your questions or comments in the chat box as appropriate so that we can have a live, lively session at the end of the talks with this i would like to hand over the podium to dr jacob vargis to introduce um, the speakers of the day and then carry on please stay till the end because we will be having a good discussion at the end thank you very much for joining once again thank you so much thank you mulida sir thank you indian college of anesthesia 95th live webinar 95 is a magical number one more six in the ipl season we are reaching the century and aptly taken the topic which is one of the most important aspect in anesthesia and intensive care management which is about the ventilators and uh, thank you so much for dr murli sir dr radhakrishnan and all dr sanish and all the team was relentlessly worked on this particular landmark uh, achievement on the in the current uh, pandemic situation because 95 95 sessions in successfully running is not a joke without wasting much of a time we will go on to the topic which is predominantly on the ventilator supports for that the first lecture in you know that anything we have to start with uh, the basics in basics of ventilation the first thing will be modes which is conventional and advanced especially important because advanced modes is something which all of us has been trained and practiced using it in the pandemic situation especially right now and many more years to come so for that let me introduce the first speaker my close friend dr arjun alva he is a uh, consultant in critical care medicine and administrative head of critical care services along with he holds the responsibility of head of department respiratory therapy services at majendra shah multi specialty hospital narayana health city bangalore so tajun every section when you talk every section when you listen even when you take class please delegates note that something you will learn from each speakers because everybody is well experienced and give you lot of lessons so kindly be attentive and please feel free to ask your questions in the chat box over to dr arjun for the first lecture thank you
Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? It's very clear, Arjun. It's very clear. Yeah, we you. can hear. We can hear. Uh, good evening to one and all. Um, again, I've uh, been given 15 minutes to discuss about the mode of ventilation. So I'm sure all of you know that if we start talking about the modes of ventilation, it will take hours for us to talk about it. So I'll quickly try and see how I can finish the just discussing about basics of ventilation that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Sorry. Okay. So the majority of, of the ventilators that we use today are all positive pressure ventilators. The, within the world of positive pressure ventilation, there are different modes that the ventilator works on. Um, out of which there are two main categories that which we, which we need to discuss about. That's volume control and pressure control. So volume control, what is volume control? So basically the clinician is setting and controlling the volume of volume of air that enters into the lungs with the knobs and with the devices on, on, the, uh, on the ventilator. The volume of air that enters into the lung is provided by the ventilator in the form of the pressurized air that enters into the lung. But what is very, very important is the, is the definition or is, is the uh, compliance. Compliance is nothing but changing the pressure and change, uh, changing the volume to change in the pressure. So we need to make sure that in volume control, we are controlling the volume, but the pressure of air that is required to deliver that volume, it varies from patient to patient and breath to breath. So volume is a constant and pressure is, is a changing variable. But when it comes to pressure control, it, the volume is the changing variable and pressure is constant. So in pressure control, when you are setting a, when you're setting a pressure, the compliance is something which is very important. For the stiff lungs, the volume that needs to be achieved will be difficult if with, with, this, with a certain pressure, isn't it? So you need to change the pressure in order to uh, achieve, the, achieve the volume. So based on the compliance of the patient's lungs, the pressure, the, the pressure can change. So we, ha we currently have multiple companies which provides different modes of ventilation. They are, are all patented. So there are almost 90 to 100 different modes of ventilation, uh, out of which probably eight or 10 are the most important that we use on day-to-day on -day, -day basis. But before starting anything on ventilation, what is the basic settings that we need to understand before, before we start putting somebody on a ventilator? So somebody, a patient coming on, in an ICU, in the theater, the basic things that we need to know is without setting a tidal volume, that is the volume of air entering into the, in, into the, uh, into the lungs, the respiratory rate that is under our control. So we can set the respiratory rate on the ventilator, positive end expiratory pressure, that the pressure uh, is between five to 10, 20 centimeters of water, uh, FiO2, that is the concentration of oxygen, which we can set between 0.3 to 1, and also a pressure support between 5 to 20 centimeters of water. What is pressure support? Pressure support is nothing but the nudge that we, that we give to a patient when the, or the ventilator gives that extra air or extra support to, to a spontaneously breathing patients. When the patient takes that spontaneous breath, the ventilator supports, supports that pressure. So that is nothing but the pressure support. So we also need to make sure that we monitor things in the ventilator. The main things are the minute ventilation, the amount of air delivered to a patient per minute. So it is very important when we are looking at the, when you are looking at the carbon dioxide clearance in the arterial blood gases, we need to make sure the minute ventilation is set on, is monitored on the ventilator. Other things, two pressures, which we have to monitor on the ventilators are um, uh, peak inspiratory pressure, which is the maximum pressure that is reached during the end of, uh, the, during the inspiration. We need to make sure that it is less than 35 centimeters of water. So 
so that we can avoid any kinds of lung injury. Another one is a plateau pressure. So it's a, it is measured at the end of inspiration, probably by using some maneuvers called as inspiratory holds, where we should make sure that they are less than 30 centimeter of water as well, so that we can avoid the barotrauma. So basically these are, uh, the plateau pressure is an indicator of lung compliance. So if the plateau pressure is going up, we, we need to make sure that we understand that the, okay, the lung compliance is poor, that the, expedite, the flow might be a problem and we need to think whether the endotracheal tube that the patient is on, is it, is it blocked or whether there is a bronchospasm. So you, you can identify these things based on monitoring of the, the ventilators. So coming to different modes of ventilation, the first mode which we could talk about is an assist controlled ventilation or the volume controlled ventilation. Again, we do the same basic settings of, of predetermined tidal volumes, predetermined uh, frequencies, concentration of oxygen, and the positive end expiratory pressure. These are all set. But this doesn't require, no pressure support is there in assist control ventilation or volume control ventilation. So what happens is, what happens when the patient takes a breath? When, when the patient is in controlled ventilation, is paralyzed, is under sedation, uh, it, uh, the ventilator just mechanically mandatorily gives the preset tidal volume at a preset respiratory rate. But what happens when the patient breathes a spontaneous breath? So at that time, in, in assist control ventilation, the, vent, the ventilator identifies the spontaneous breath and delivers the full set tidal volume. Okay, It doesn't allow the patient to take that spontaneous breath or doesn't support that breath. Instead, it identifies, okay, the, okay I, am, I am trying to take a breath and the ventilator just delivers the set tidal volume. What can this lead to is this can lead to excessive ventilation when the patient is, has got tachypnea for non-respiratory reasons, like the patient might be in pain uh, or he might have some neurological disorder. During that time, even a small trigger can lead to excessive ventilation in patients resulting in respiratory alkalosis and all those kind of things. So that is the disadvantage of the assist control ventilation. And to to avoid this, or in, uh, there was more research and they thought about synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. I'm sure you all have heard of synchronized SIMV mode, isn't it? What is the difference between the SIMV mode when compared to the, uh, uh, to the previous mode, that is assist controlled ventilation or the volume control? The only difference is what happens during the spontaneous breath. When the patient is allowed to take here in the SMB made the mode, the patient is allowed to take whatever breath that is that is possible. So you the, the ventilator doesn't give an extra breath. But you can also do a, some sort of different setting where SI, in SMB mode, the pressure support can be set. So when the patient is, is triggering, the ventilator can support and uh, give enough tidal volume. So this was basically initially designed for weaning of patients as well. <laughs> Other modes, pressure support ventilation. So pressure support ventilation is usually a trial mode before extubation. Okay, many of the, many of you you can hear a lot of people talking about pressure support ventilation as CPAP. No, no, pressure support ventilation is not a CPAP. Pressure support ventilation is where it is a form of spontaneous breathing where you set the FiO2, where you set the PEEP and a pressure support, but no set tidal volumes or respiratory rate is there. But when the patient is has apnea then there is a safety mechanism which will shift the ventilatory mode from support to a control mode of ventilation and what about pressure control what does what does pressure control do previous modes what we talked about was, was mainly vent, was volume control what about pressure control in pressure control we set the fio2 respiratory rate and and peep and along with that the two other things that we, we set are the inspiratory pressure and the time. So ventilator is going to switch from what PEEP is set to the inspiratory pressure set, and it is going to hold for a set inspiratory time before falling back to PEEP, okay? So, so, that, that was, so if you see this graph, so the initial with, uh, uh, this is the peak inspiratory pressure where the tidal volume is entering into the lungs, it holds off at, at certain uh, at certain pressure and then comes down at a uh, inspiratory time okay so the next mode is probably more advanced mode which we've been using during during the covid times was 
was the dual mode of ventilation that is the pressure regulated volume controlled ventilation so this is a combination of both pressure and volume control the operate it operates like a pressure control but ensures that a set volume is achieved it during this mode the adjustments are made very slowly over a period of time we are going to have a respiratory rate fio2 peep and along with that there's something called as a target volume so we set we set a target volume of about example 500 ml so if you look at this graph so we've set a target volume of 500 ml okay and the ventilator does a test trial where at the at the set fio2 peep and frequency along with the target volume so the ventilator will give, will set a pressure of for example in this about pressure of 20 pressure of 20 you generate a tidal volume of 450 so the next breath it probably will generate a tidal volume of 480 with slight increase in the pressure so it will slowly in a stepwise manner increase the uh, pressures pressures until it re reaches a target until it reaches a target volume okay that is nothing but pressure regulated volume control Okay. At the same time, if at the same pressure of 25, if the if the tidal volume increases to about 600, so it is smart enough to reduce the pressure support until the target volume of 500 ml is achieved. So this is nothing but PRVC, which is also an advanced mode. Okay. So another advanced mode is airway pressure release ventilation or APRV mode. I'm sure all of you have heard of APRV mode as well. So in many of the uh, countries like Canada, they've used APRV quite extensively during during the ARDS, or during the COVID COVID ARDS. Although it is it is a pressure control, but it is nothing but a CPAP with high pressures. Okay, so it holds a prolonged a prolonged period of high pressure with short periods of release of pressure. Okay, it's an extremely good mode at recruitment. Okay, it keeps the alveoli open due to having a very high peak mean airway pressure and helps in oxygenation. Here, the settings that we set are one is FiO2, T high, T low. Again, as the name says, T high, that is uh, a time high, and P high and P low, which is the pressure. Okay, P high and P low. Again, this is the graph, uh, graphic representation of what happens. So, um, at a set, sorry. At this P high, okay, or at this the the, the, uh, the pressure. This is the pressure. At this pressure, it maintains a T high, okay, and then it comes falls down. Okay, during this time, the tidal volume, the volume of air enters into into the lung, and immediately there is a pressure release, and it increases again. The pressure goes up again, okay, and it 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 maintains that of particular T high and falls down again. So here we do not set a respiratory rate. Instead, the difference between the T high and the T low, that will give you, for example, you can set a T high of about 5.5 and T low of about 0.5. So the difference the, uh, will give about, it will give you about six seconds. So the total respiratory rate will be about 12, or uh, probably, uh, sorry, the respiratory rate will be about 10. Okay. so. Uh, this is a place where you uh, where, where the tidal volumes are based on the pressure the, the p high and the and the p low that will uh, uh, dedicate what tidal volume you can you can set at so other modes of ventilation uh, advanced ventilation is high frequency ventilation there are multiple high frequency ventilation positive pressure ventilation percussive ventilation jet ventilation and oscillatory ventilation um, again, uh, this is the machine that we use for high frequency oscillatory ventilation. It is more commonly used in the uh, neonatal ICUs where they maintain a very high mean airway pressure, very high frequency is set, uh, typically at four to seven hertz. So this hertz is nothing but it, one hertz is equivalent to about 60 to 70 respiratory rate per minute. So uh, if you're looking at four to seven hertz, so we're looking at a respiratory rate at a rate of 200 to to 300 uh, per minute. The tidal volume that is generated is very low, about one to two ml per kg. Um, so the high frequency oscillatory ventilation is mainly used in patients where there is they're finding it difficult to wean a patient on high FiO2. 
or peak inspiratory pressures are more than 30 or 35. In institutes where patients are, ha are having bad respiratory failure, unable to, unable to improve their compliance, and patients who and hospitals which do not have ECMO might attempt to have high frequency oscillatory oscillatory ventilation. But although, but we don't use it that often. Okay, it is more of a CPAP system with a piston displacement of 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 gases. Okay, um, again, uh, so last last few slides are regarding what are the other modes of advanced ventilation. So, so the other modes of advanced ventilation. These were the newer modes of advanced ventilation which came uh, in order to avoid a patient and ventilator asynchrony. So these are the few few things like neurally adjusted ventilatory assist or NAVA and Hamilton, uh, the Hamilton came with adoptive support ventilation and proportional assist ventilation. So this was, a, this was an adoptive support ventilation which they said one ventilatory mode fits all from intubation to extubation. Uh, they just would put on the adoptive support ventilation and it would help help them in getting the patient off the ventilator. And what happens in passive patient that is a paralyzed and, and sedated patient, the, um, uh, it, it would act as a volume targeted pressure control mode with automatic adjustment of the inspiratory pressures, respiratory rate, uh, the ratios, and it would change the tidal volume based on the patient's, the patient's requirement. Okay, so it was also called as an intelligent, uh, uh, intelligent mode. Um, in some of the, it's become quite popular in many of the hospitals in the country because the, the uh, clinician adjustments were, were minimal and it definitely helped in some centers with, with COVID as well because it was an intelligent uh, mode and it would, uh, once the patient was put on the ventilator, it would do, do its own calculations and would manage the patient. Again, uh, uh, NAVA, it, it was a neurally, nothing but a neurally adjusted ventilatory assist. It's a new mode of mechanical ventilation. So what it does, it uses the electrical activity of the diaphragm to trigger and cycle the inspiratory assistant and provide it in proportion to the patient's effort. So what they used to do is there is a gastric feeding tube, a dedicated gastric feeding tube, uh, which would identify or activate this uh, diaphragm and it would uh, and it would uh, uh, help in uh, providing a ventilatory support. Okay, there's well documentation to reduce the patient ventilatory asynchrony. So yeah, so basically, uh, so that was my 15, 20 minutes of the yeah, So basically this was a very um, uh, brief discussion on, on different modes of ventilation. And probably we can discuss more if people have any questions on it at the end of end of all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arjun. I know the time is always a constraint for you. You have to tell a lot of things to uh, to explain. But you know we covered it well on time. Especially the advanced mode, uh, you, the drive drawings make it very simple. Discussions to happen after the end of the sessions. Over to next speaker and the chairperson. Dr. Ratan Gupta. Ratan, sir, please introduce the next speaker. Okay, I'm sharing my slides. Yeah. Ratan, sir, you are not audible. Ratan, sir. Dr. Ratan is not audible, I think. I'll contact him. In the meantime, uh, Harish can start. I'll introduce Harish then, sir. Maybe the quick introduction. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Please, yeah. Please, please. yeah. Um, so after uh, uh, the modes of ventilation, we have learned how to ventilate a patient. Um, it's also equally important to know what are the limitations of ventilator and what all harms uh, can uh, come uh, because of uh, ventilating a patient, whether it's uh, invasive or non-invasive, uh, it really doesn't matter. What is important is uh, uh, we have to limit the vital volume, we have to limit the pressures, 
and uh, repeated atelectasis and the opening and closing of the uh, alveolus, all this can lead to uh, injuries. Uh, I invite uh, Dr. Harish uh, uh, to speak about uh, uh, how to uh, control uh, ventilator induced lung injury. Dr. Harish is an accomplished uh, speaker. Um, he is working at Narayan Hudalaya Critical Care Medicine. And uh, he's also editor in chief of uh, Journal of Respiratory Care. So it's a very appropriate uh, topic for him. Uh, Dr. Harish. Thank you, sir. So maybe in another 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to uh, cover uh, what I prefer to do to prevent the ventilator induced lung injury. So with a backup of some evidence, what happened in the last one, one and a half decade. So we know that when a patient is on mechanical ventilation, even though we appropriately achieved the goal of arterial blood gases, patient is going to die. So they evaluated long back during the polio event and all. So they found there is something happening beyond what existing pathology, so which is giving rise to some sort of structural damage. So then they came to understand, so there is something bothering, so which initially labeled as ventilator associated lung injury. So even though we used like synonymously ventilator associated lung injury and that of the ventilator induced lung injury, so ventilator associated lung injury can happen with the pre-existing normal lung or a diseased lung. So ventilator induced lung injury is straightforward is the sequelae of the mechanical ventilation. So that is a simple understanding of ventilator associated lung injury and that of the ventilator induced lung injury. So what exactly happens? Like we know that when we ventilate the patient with some sort of tidal volume, which is beyond the required for that lung. So then we are going to have something called, so injury at the high lung volume. So when patient is not received the appropriate PEEP, PEEP works as a surfactant. It is going to prevent the collapse of the alveoli at the end of expiration. So when we ventilate with the inadequate tidal volume, with the inadequate PEEP, so patient is going to have something called so low lung volume. So both lung, low lung volume and that of the high lung volume is going to have a structural consequences, which is similar to that of the ARDS or acute lung injury pathophysiology, which is going to cause some sort of hyaline membrane formation. So leaky capillaries, pulmonary edema. So there is a surfactant dysfunction. So down the line, it also kicks off some sort of fibroproliferative uh, like problem. So then we have something called barotrauma. So which is going to have some sort of the loco regional effect. So basically the alveoli are going to get ruptured. So because of increase in transpulmonary pressure, which leads to some sort of uh, leak in the perialveolar tissue, which can kick off pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, so and subcutaneous emphysema and all. So this is one way of like volute trauma. We have barrett trauma and repeated collapse and that of the distension of the alveoli that leads to atelectotrauma. So finally, these three things are going to give rise to something called biotrauma, which means there is a shear stress is going to generate it within the alveoli because of repeated collapse and distension. And it is also between the like gas and that of the alveolar phase. So alveoli is going to get flooded with some sort of pro-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-6, IL-beta, TNF-alpha and all with some sort of inflammatory cells also. So that triggers something called like biotrauma. So basically final outcome of this atelectotrauma, volutrauma, barotrauma, biotrauma leads to multi-organ involvement. So it started in the lung, but it can have a systemic like impact which leads to multi-organ dysfunction and that of the mortality. So one more thing we need to understand when it comes to uh, like ventilator induced lung injury, there is something called stress and strain. So stress is being linked with the transpulmonary pressure, so which gives an idea about the barotrauma. So it is the damage to the lung skeletal of structure of the lung. So when we have strain, so it is because of the impact of this pressure. So what is the changes in the volume as compared to that of the existing volume? So we have a relationship between this transpulmonary pressure, which tells about the barotrauma, which we call it as stress, and that of the strain. So which we measure by change in tidal volume as compared to that of the residual I mean, resting lung volume, that is the FRC. We have something called like a specific lung elastance constant, which is going to be around 12. So if you see this diagram, whenever there is an increase in transpulmonary pressure, I know I told that it is going to be linked with that of the barotrauma, but the significance of 
like volume trauma which is going to happen because of the increase in strain is going to be exponential so as the barrow trauma increases with the increase in transpulmonary pressure so the increase in strain is going to be exponential after certain limit so we have to play around all these things like transpulmonary pressure volume and that of the peep applied to reduce the ventilator induced lung injury so can we predict which patient is going to have ventilator induced lung injury we have some scores like lung injury prediction score early acute lung injury score and all so these have been studied in the perioperative post operative patients and all it is not validated among all the critically ill patients so we need more and more data which include some sort of predisposing condition some risk stratification so oxygen requirement is respiratory rate and the immune status of the patient in the early acute lung injury score so we have something called like mechanical power which is gaining more and more like attraction nowadays lots of research is happening so what they have done they incorporated everything which have an impact on the ventilator induced lung injury so they included tidal volume pressure flow and that of the respirator respiratory rate so which all are contributing to that of the ventilator induced lung injury so lots of data available so some of the ventilator give this mechanical power directly if the value is somewhere more than 20 25 so high mechanical power of ventilation is independently associated with higher in hospital mortality so there are lots of data coming with the mechanical power so again what we can really do to reduce this ventilator induced lung injury some ventilator options like we can manipulate some adjunctive therapies are there some pharmacological therapy including neuromuscular blocking agents so we'll go one by one briefly so when it comes to like ventilator manipulation first is the tidal volume we know that so lots of data available in terms of high versus low tidal volume we follow something called lung protective ventilation with a low tidal volume the first trial so evidence which gives some impact on the reduction in mortality that is arma trial where they compared 6 versus that of the 12 ml so now it's a standard of practice even in the perioperative area even in the post operative period even when a patient is not having ards lung also to practice 6 ml per kg of the ideal body weight or the predicted body weight not the whole body weight because so some patient who is obese doesn't mean is going to have the such a huge lung at all so we need to calculate the tidal volume according to the predicted body weight so that is the ideal body weight so what it is going to cause so it helps in reducing the mortality significantly along with that so non pulmonary organ dysfunction is also going to be reduced so definitely all these things are going to happen with a reduction in ventilator induced lung injury reduction in that of the bio trauma reduction in cytokine storm cytokine release so which have an impact on the multi organ dysfunction and also definitely one therapy we need to stick on to reduce the ventilator induced lung injury is like low tidal volume ventilation so next we can play around with something called peep so how to choose this optimal peep so trying for an ideal always we are able to achieve at the bedside that is the million dollar question so peep acts as a artificial surfactant i told in ards so one pathophysiology which is going to happen is like surfactant dysfunction is going to be there so surfactant is necessary to prevent the total collapse of the alveoli at the end of expiration when you put the peep in an appropriate way it is going to prevent the collapse of the alveoli at the end of expiration so it is going to indirectly prevent the atelectrode trauma so we need to put appropriate peep suppose in the beginning if you put the proper peep so that that is adequate during that phase if you put more and more peep so it is going to cause over distension of the alveoli so if you keep the same peep which you set in the initial when the progression or the means disease process has been controlled the initial normal peep may become as an abnormal peep so we dynamically should monitor what amount of peep we need to put that particular patient in relation to the process or the progress of the disease status so basically when we call it as optimal peep so any peep which should improve the oxygenation so which should help in improving the function residual capacity reduction in the shunt so improve the overall compliance along with that which should not have any bad hemodynamic impact which should not decrease the venous return because of increase in intrathoracic pressure should not cause hypotension with a decrease in cardiac output should not increase worsening of ventilation perfusion mismatch which should not cause barrow trauma should not increase the shunt so how to choose this optimal peep so one method is so we need to put the peep in the pressure versus volume uh, loop so just above that of the lower inflection point so what exactly this 
lower inflection point so we know that in the beginning alveoli just started distending so just started opening so that point we call it as a lower inflection point there is something called upper inflection or higher inflection point where the alveoli started over distending so if you put the peep just above the lower inflection point definitely it is going to prevent the collapse of the alveoli at the end of expiration so together we call it as a lung protective ventilation to prevent the ventilator induced lung injury there is a low tidal volume along with that of the optimal peep so can we give more and more high peep if you go through the artsnet protocol which is given an peep like lower peep for the same fio2 and that is the higher peep for the same fio2 so definitely we can give but you need to understand the benefit is going to be more than that of the injury because of the peep when a patient is having a recruitable lung with a low tidal volume we can opt for the high peep so when patient is having a recruitable lung if the lung is not recruitable even if you apply the moderate amount of the peep which is going to cause more injury than that of the benefit so with this concept so there was one paper out in 2013 which got published in respiratory care can we individualize the peep is it going to have any added benefit than just following like peep and that of the fio2 uh, protocol of that of the artsnet so clearly this data suggest so if you keep on increasing the peep from the baseline of around 5 cm of water with the increment of 2 and measure the like compliance with the formula like tidal volume divided by peep plateau minus peep and keep the peep when the compliance is maximum so that clearly suggested decrease in organ dysfunction increase in respiratory and hemodynamic failure free days so definitely if you individualize the peep than just adopting the peep as per the artsnet protocol which is going to reduce the ventilator induced lung injury in that particular patient so a little bit other concept we need to understand is the transpulmonary pressure when we ventilate the patient it is going to create the pressure inside the alveoli because of the positive pressure ventilation and it is going to create pressure inside the pleura also the difference between intra alveolar and that of the intra pleural pressure we call it as a transpulmonary pressure so we are not able to get this transpulmonary pressure directly so we measure something called plateau pressure which is the end inspiratory pressure when there is no air flow which is happening into the alveoli that we use as a surrogate marker to get an idea about the lung injury that is a surrogate marker for the transpulmonary pressure suppose if you measure this pleural pressure by any modality like esophageal pressure monitoring so is it helpful in reducing the ventilator induced lung injury definitely yes so this was the paper which got published long back in enegem so clearly which suggest if you use like adjusting the peep according to the like esophageal pressure monitoring as compared to that of the standard way of keeping the peep by fio2 uh, table so definitely this helps in reducing the ventilator induced lung injury so which improves the oxygenation significantly along with adequate maintaining of, of the compliance so we need to titrate the peep if at all if you are having a esophageal pressure monitoring so nowadays advanced ventilators inbuilt they are having a esophageal manometer and all so one more concept we need to understand to reduce the ventilator induced lung injury that is the driving pressure i told so we need to choose the low tidal volume to ventilate the like small amount of the healthy non affected lung in the non dependent area so that we call it as a baby lung but the problem is if you apply the tidal volume according to the total means ideal body weight even we don't know about the compliance of that remaining baby lung so we need to consider that functional size and the compliance of that remaining lung that is a baby lung that we can get an idea by something called driving pressure so it is the ratio between tidal volume and that of the respiratory system compliance at the bed side how we can calculate driving pressure it is very simple if you put end inspiratory volt if we are going to get p plateau if you minus the peep from that of the p plateau the value we get is the driving pressure so definitely this driving pressure helps in improving the survival if you are going to keep the driving pressure somewhere less than or equal to 14 or 15 so data is available so not the tidal volume okay so it is the driving pressure which gives an idea about the barotrauma significantly we can get an idea by monitoring the driving pressure Now, if you keep it less than 14 15 and all it is good as compared to just adjusting the tidal volume so that i suggesting so this is one more pressure we need to remember at the bedside when we like to try to prevent the ventilator induced lung injury so this is how we can titrate peep in ards one method is like using the regular artsnet uh, like a given table we need to understand when you 
like keep the peep so our oxygenation goal is sufficient somewhere po2 of 55 to 80 and spo2 of 88 to 95 we don't want totally normalization of the abg and all because it may cause some problem with that of the ventilator induced lung injury so we have something called decremental and incremental uh, peep trial so basically as i told either you go up on the peep from a baseline by about 2 cm of water or you come down from a higher peep by about 2 cm of water but we need to record a plateau pressure driving pressure and oxygen saturation that of the blood pressure because all these factors are going to be impacted by that of the peep if peep is behaving like a bad peep so their driving pressure is going to be kicked off their saturation will not improve they will have compromised hemodynamics their peep plateau is going to be more than 30 so this we can do at the bedside that is called incremental or decremental method so or if you have a esophageal manometer we can use that to adjust the peep or we can use the pv loop as i like told just keep the peep above the lower inflection point to prevent the collapse of the alveoli at the end of expiration there is something called stress index if you plot pressure versus time scalar you will get the curvature scalar like this so if the stress index is 1 so this is the optimal recruitment so peep is adequate if it is like concave it is stress index more than 1 so there is a over distension so decrease the peep so if the patient having a good recruitable lung so then it is going to be less than 1 with a convexity so this we can use at the bedside to understand to reduce the ventilator induced lung injury so one thing we need to understand is like irrationality of the recruitment maneuver you have to remember so all that looks like a recruitable is not going to be recruitable so that we need to remember there are multiple methods so we can follow for the recruitment but it is not advised routinely doing the recruitment maneuver for all the patient so because we need to understand we want functional recruitment not that of the anatomical recruitment see basically we put the peep to prevent the collapse of the alveoli at the end of expiration to initiate that expansion what the maneuver we are going to do like transiently we are going to increase the volume inside the alveoli that is the simple terminology how we can understand the recruitment so basically if you just keep on increasing the alveolar volume so it may cause alveolar reaeration no doubt it may cause the vessel compression so pf ratio may like deranged so it is going to reduce the lung compliance even though we have a anatomical recruitment but it is not causing any functional recruitment in terms of improvement of the compliance improvement in the pf ratio and all so we need to understand which lung we can routinely go for the recruitment maneuver because if you do recruitment maneuver for all the patient it is going to cause ventilator induced lung injury so if the etiology for ards is extra pulmonary like sepsis okay so that is called secondary ards so non pulmonary ards and if the opacities are like homogeneous opacities there is a high potential for the recruitment if the cause is pulmonary like pneumonia is causing ards drowning is causing ards pulmonary contusion is causing ards toxic fume inhalation is causing ards so it is a heterogeneous opacity less likely the lung is going to get recruited this is one thought process we can just do at the bedside before we going for the lung recruitment so one rationality suppose if you avoid giving the tidal volume at all give very small amount of the tidal volume by something called high frequency oscillatory ventilation so this tidal volume is less than 2 ml per kg or 3 ml per kg can we reduce the ventilator induced lung injury and can we improve the survival rate and all we got two major trial on this theoretically fantastic but oscar trial doesn't shows any benefit or any harmful effect but oscillate trial prematurely stopped because lots of mortality lots of unstable hemodynamics and lots of need of mother relaxant and that are the sedative agents but still it's having a good theoretical rationality to reduce the ventilator induced lung injury so this is one meta analysis which got published after oscar and that of the oscillate trial still it is favoring the use of so high frequency oscillatory ventilation to reduce the ventilator induced lung injury but we need well conducted data in the coming days again one best strategy to reduce ventilator induced lung injury is like appropriate positioning that is a prone ventilation so definitely this is the standard of care with the background of pandemic even all level 2 icus they started doing this prone ventilation so it definitely having a role improve the recruitability of the lung so which helps in homogeneous distribution of the ventilation and perfusion so which prevents the compression effect of the cardiac and abdominal uh, 
like uh, organs and the lung so which helps in drainage of the secretion and all so when we have improved recruitability so obviously will definitely come down on the tidal volume so obviously it's going to help in reducing the transpulmonary pressure and p plateau so indirectly this putting a patient on a prone ventilation automatically it is decreasing the need of the volume and that of the pressure and that of the peak. So indirectly it helps in reducing the ventilator induced lung injury. So lots of data, landmark trial, Proceva trial. So 16 hours of prone with a patient who had a moderate to severe category of the ARDS with a PF ratio of less than 150. So there was a good mortality benefit. So lots of data after the Proceva trial also favoring like prone ventilation as a modality for lung protective ventilation. So with like some sort of benefit for the reduction in ventilator induced lung injury. So one more therapy that is partial extracorporeal support, we call it as low flow ECMO, NOVA lung, A lung. See the concept, the rationality is, so we know that we need to give the low tidal volume to prevent the ventilator induced lung injury. Suppose if you come down less than 4 ml, less than 3 ml and all. So that strategy called ultra lung protective ventilation strategy. But the problem is when you reduce the volume to prevent the ventilator induced lung injury, so we need to accept the high carbon dioxide. Suppose if you have any modality to take out that carbon dioxide, indirectly we can further come down on the tidal volume, which can prevent the ventilator induced lung injury. So there is a trial called supernova trial. So which doesn't show major benefit, but this is one modality we can use to reduce the tidal volume and to take out the carbon dioxide to prevent the ventilator induced lung injury. So then some pharmacological aspect. So that is a neuromuscular blocking agent. Why we need, there is something called patient self-inflicted lung injury. Suppose if you allow the patient who is sick, who is having a bad severe ARDS to breathe on the ventilator. So he's going to generate more and more negative pressure in the intrapleural compartment, which kicks off the transpulmonary pressure more than 35, 40 and all. So this injury, we call it as patient self-inflicted lung injury. So we can adjust the need, needed pressure control, pressure support or that of the PEEP. But sometimes if it is beyond the control, then we need neuromuscular blocking agent. So initially we got some trial called accuracy trial. So moderate to severe category of the ARDS with a PF ratio of less than 150. Initial 48 hours, ventilate them with a the muscle relaxation using cisetracurium. Very good mortality benefit. Then the confusion was whether the benefit in reduction of ventilator in, in, induced lung injury happened because of the good synchrony, because of the muscle relaxant effect, or cisetracurium is having some sort of anti-inflammatory effect. We don't know. So later we got one more trial that is the petal trial. Unfortunately, it doesn't show any major benefit in terms of using cisetracurium as a neuromuscular blocking agent. But so do we put a pull stop for using the neuromuscular blocking agent? No. So it is a good modality to prevent the willy. So we got lots of meta-analysis very recently published in 2021. So included around 1,500 and uh, 50 odd patients around six studies clearly which suggest it should be the modality of therapy in the moderate to severe ARDS in the initial 48 hours which definitely helps in reducing incidence of ventilator induced lung injury along with that of the reduction in the day 28 mortality also. So yes for the neuromuscular blocking agent. So then conservative fluid management. So this also is one of the like part and parcel to reduce the ventilator induced lung injury. So basically it helps in preventing the stiffness, preventing the congestion, so preventing the extravascular lung water index increase and all. So we need to go for the conservative fluid strategy once your resuscitation is adequate. Good urine output, lactate normalized, warm peripheries, Okay, so no delay in the capillary refilling and all in a ARDS patient go for the conservative modality. We can consider de resuscitation. Lots of data available. So this was the long back data published. So we got fact trial, so which is from the ArtsNet group clearly suggest. So conservative fluid management after adequate resuscitation helps in preventing the mortality reduction in that of the like need of the duration of mechanical ventilation and all. So lots of anti-inflammatory therapy, stem cell therapy has been tried. So not only for ARDS pathophysiology to get halted, also to prevent the ventilator induced lung injury. So lots of therapies are there, but none of them showed a major outcome benefit at the bedside. So it may be like Inhaled nitric oxide, prostacycline, corticosteroid, statin, beta 2 agonist, ketoconazole. So all these things has been tried addressing the oxidative injury, free radical injury. Okay. But we don't have any clear cut data on all these things except steroids in 
like covid pneumonia so we don't have a data in terms of reducing the ventilator induced lung injury with these pharmacotherapies so finally to conclude we have different strategies their mechanism of action and how we can monitor at the bedside including uh, like limiting a tidal volume so limiting inspiratory pressure applying an optimal ideal peep so limiting the respiratory rate so that we can prevent the repeated collapse and expansion of the alveoli so limit the spontaneous respiratory effort to prevent the patient self inflicted lung injury one major therapy which is gold standard along with the low tidal volume ventilation is the prone positioning thank you uh, uh, there was a very lucid presentation uh, dr harish with a lot of studies uh, uh, to uh, quote. Um, the question answers uh, are uh, invited uh, at the end. You can pose your questions. Uh, I invite the next uh, uh, and uh, the uh, presenter. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity and, in, and the invitation. Dr. Anup, who is Yeah, sir. Yes. So, uh, we already had uh, two important topics. Now we are uh, moving on to an, another important topics on uh, lung mechanics. So, the knowing the mechanics and uh, like adjusting uh, your settings is very important in properly ventilating a patient. To talk on that subject, we have uh, uh, my friend, Dr. Vimal Bharadwaj. He's a consultant in critical care medicine from Narayana Health City, Bangalore. So more than an intensivist and uh, clinician, he's an expert in uh, uh, device uh, 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 device designing as well. You can see like he has four patents. I don't know that, uh, I know Bimal for many years, but I was not knowing that he's having so many inventions and all. So it is excellent. So I think he will be a best person to uh, tell us on how to utilize these machines to properly assess the mechanics and uh, utilize those things in uh, mechanically ventilating uh, these patients. Over to Vimal. Thank you. So quickly to, uh, so let's know about uh, respiratory mechanics. So it's, it's nothing but the mechanical property of the respiratory system. So unless and until we can see the respiratory mechanics, you cannot gauge the problem and alleviate uh, the problem by appropriate ventilatory settings. So basically knowing the respiratory mechanics will help us to diagnose the lung condition and thereby adjust the ventilator settings. There are, just to simplify it, there are only two properties of the lung which is of paramount importance, which is compliance and resistance. There are other properties as well, like viscoelastic property, inertia, which are not very significant although they do contribute a bit, but the two main properties are only compliance and resistance. So let's know these in brief and, uh, and what are the measures to, to measure these mechanics. The compliance is nothing but the volume change for unit change of pressure, or it gives the elasticity of the lung. So there are two entities attached to this compliance. One is a dynamic compliance and other one is a static compliance. As the term is self-explanatory, uh, self dynamic compliance is measured once there is an airflow in circulation. So if there is an airflow going through the tracheobronchial tree into the lungs, so that is dynamic compliance which is nothing but the compliance of the entire respiratory system, including the tracheobronchial tree. As well as uh, once we choose the static compliance, so to measure static compliance, we need to go for end inspiratory hold like this. Once we go for an end inspiratory hold, so there is no flow into the tracheobronchial tree and whatever pressure the air is building in the lung, is what reflects the static compliance. Or in other words, we can say that static compliance reflects the lung elasticity. So the static compliance in a normal individual is 50 to 60 ml per centimeter of water. The decreased compliance 
can occur in ARDS, atelectasis, pneumothorax, lung fibrosis, or any condition which can cause compression of the lung or alters the elasticity of the lung, causing it to be more stiff. So these are the situations wherein it can cause a decreased lung compliance. So static compliance should be a part of daily assessment. So it will give an enormous information about the lung stiffness as well as the elastic properties of the lung. And static compliance can decrease with the severity of the ARDS. The more severe the ARDS, the lesser the compliant, uh, compliance of the lung. The increase in the lung compliance can be seen in emphysematous lung. Resistance is nothing but what is the, the force, opposing force towards the gas flow into the, uh, to the respiratory system. So the normal value is between 10 to 15 centimeter of water per liter. So it is nothing but it is calculated by the pressure difference divided by flow. Now, coming to what should we measure at the bedside. So, most important thing is as a part of protective lung, vent uh, lung ventilation strategy, which Dr. Harish has dealt with in his presentation. So, the peak pressure and plateau pressure. Plateau pressure uh, has to be a part of your daily rounds. So, once you go for an end inspiratory hold, then there, there will be a cessation of flow into the tracheobronchial tree. So there won't be any flow of air in the tracheobronchial tree. And the compliance, whatever is measured is nothing but the static compliance. And corroborating to that is the plateau pressure. That is the lung compliance, uh, which translates into the pressure buildup will be the plateau pressure. Now this very important aspect that is if the difference between the peak inspiratory pressure and the plateau pressure, if it is more, that means to say that the pressure buildup is happening predominantly in the tracheobronchial tree, or there is a problem with regards to the endotracheal tube or with regards to the tracheobronchial tree. That's why the peak airway pressures are high, but there is a normal plateau pressure. So when this is high, that then we can check if there is, an, uh, there is an endotracheal tube kinking or more commonly, are there any buildup of secretions causing an increase in the resistance? And if the plateau pressures, if the total pressure is high and the difference between the peak inspiratory pressure and the plateau pressure is small, that means to say that we are dealing with a really low lung compliant condition. It can be an extremely fibrotic condition like worsening of ILD or more commonly severity of ARDS. Uh, so by, by just doing, uh, by just capturing the plateau pressure value, one can see whether the pathology lies in the tracheobronchial tree or the endotracheal tube, or is it with the lung per se? So this is an important parameter to be assessed on a daily basis. And now coming to the more important aspect, and which is usually missed on a day-to-day -day basis, which is the time constant. So the time constant is nothing but, in, the, uh, in a very simpler language, I will try to put it across, how the alveolus changes its volume with regards to the change in the pressure, or it really, uh, enumerates the, the alveolar distensibility characteristics. That's what a time constant means. So the actual definition is for every step change in pressure, what is the change in the volume that you get? So the time constant, since the lungs are inhomogeneous, as was rightly uh, shown by Harish in his presentation, but that there was a very popular trial wherein uh, the personalized PEEP was beneficial. So similarly, this time constant gives a very personalized uh, assessment of lung alveolar. So for, uh, so time constant is nothing but a product of compliance and resistance. So you can get this value in the inspiration. RC is nothing but a time constant 
you can get a product of static compliance and the respiration in during the inspiration or uh, resistance during the inspiration or during the expiration as well but expiratory time constant is more informative because it is passive and it gives a very good account of the patient's respiratory mechanics or the alveolar characteristics since it is impossible the we have got millions of alveoli so it is impossible to gauge each and every alveolus characteristics so this gives an overall view of the the various alveoli and whether we are giving the appropriate ventilation or not let's see how it helps so to just to enumerate the the inhomogeneity of the lungs this figure might be useful so this is a figure depicting the volume change on the y axis and the time on the x axis so in those patients who have got an equal compliance in the resistance the filling of the alveoli is usually at the equal rate because the distensibility is almost correlating which doesn't happen most of the times uh, in the lung there are something uh, some alveoli are faster filling some alveoli are slower filling that is uh, some alveoli have a prolonged time constant and some alveoli have a smaller time constant so that's why it is inhomogeneous in nature what happens once there is an extra added pathology for example in lung unit b if there is a higher resistance then it fills in very slowly so the time constant value will be on a higher side and what happens if the lung unit b has a lower compliance so it fills at the same rate but it Uh, but it might not fill in completely depending on the ventilatory strategy so based on this inhomogeneity one can get a good value of whether the ventilation is happening appropriately or not as i told it's nothing but a product of resistance and the compliance so in this condition so in the ventilator graphics that i have captured so the respiration the resistance is 10 and the compliance the static compliance is 60 the product of it is nothing but 0.6 if you convert ml into the liters so the time constant the value is in seconds this is a normal time constant the time constant value is between 0.5 to 0.7 seconds so here you can say that the uh, the ventilatory strategy is satisfactory now let's look at this uh, at this time constant you have got an increase in the resistance of 23 against the normal resistance value being 10 to 15 so 23 into 51 is close to 1.68 so if the value is more than 0.7 that means to say that there is an increase in the resistance if there is an increase in the resistance then right from the assessment of the endotracheal tube right from the kinking of the endotracheal tube to the build up of the secretions to bronchospasm uh, we need to check for the lung pathology so in that way it can be very very helpful to see where exactly the problem lies now let's look at this this ventilator graphic here there is a normal resistance but the compliance has reduced from 50 to 60 it has reduced to 32 the product of it translates to a really lessened uh, rc that is 0.4 which is less than 0.5 again that means to say that we are dealing with a with a very low lung compliant compliance that is a severe ards or a pneumothorax or a pleural effusion or a bad congestive cardiac failure causing flooding of uh, of the lungs uh, causing pulmonary edema so there could be many differential diagnosis for this sort of a value so now we know that the problem is with with the lung and we are dealing with a low lung compliance so the therapy can go according to this condition and also i have not mentioned it on the slide 
how many times do we really see whether the expiratory time is appropriate or not or whether the inspiratory time is appropriate or not for the lung to get emptied at least three to four time constants is required at three time constants the 95 percent of the lung will get emptied so in that aspect also time constant can be can give a valuable information so now let's see how to apply it at the bedside. Now, for example, if you get a short RC or a time constant, that means to say that patient is at risk for ventilator induced lung injury, and we need to closely monitor for tidal volume, driving pressure, and plateau pressure. In those patients who have got a long RC, that means to say that we might be dealing with a higher resistance. It can be a bad exacerbation of COPD, dynamic hyperinflation is a real problem and we need to carefully look at whether the, the, there is a, a built up of autopeep or not. So it can give a fair assessment of the severity of the condition and what parameters to especially look at. And apart from this, it can be a real prognostic tool as well. If the time constant, for example, you have proned a patient, a bad, severe ARDS patient uh, to proning, and see whether the patient is really responding uh, to this therapy or not, to this rescue strategy or not. So with after proning, if the time constant is starts to improve, that means to say that the compliance is improving and the patient is recruiting. So it can not only be a measure or a, pro, a prognostic marker, but also it can give an insight into the patient's improving condition as well. So apart from this, the time constant can give a real insight into sudden events. There are instances uh, on a daily basis in ICU, you tend to come across a sudden event. And if you want to understand what precipitated that event, the understanding this time constant can be really be valuable. If someone had a, a, a near normal time constant, for example, 0.6, and suddenly it had risen to 1.6, then we can say that probably we might be dealing with the kinking of the tube or a mucus plugging of the endotracheal tube causing an increase in the resistance. So that answers uh, some of the questions of what led to such kind of a sudden respiratory event. And, and if there is a sudden decrease in the, in the RC or the time constant, it could be a flash pulmonary edema or a pneumothorax uh, or, a, or, a, or any, of the, uh, any, of the, any of the conditions which can cause a low lung compliance. So in that way, it can be really informative. So my main idea of this session was to draw the attention towards the lesser cared for topics, that is time constant, which can be very, very valuable on a day-to-day -day clinical practice. This ends my short session and thanks a lot for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Vimal, for that uh, excellent uh, session and again, uh... You have nicely explained how to clinically apply these uh, parameters. So, as with other uh, uh, topics, we will take the questions towards the end. Excellent presentation, Vimal. Uh, we move on to the next topic, uh, ventilator graphics. Dr. Shivangi. Yes. Uh, ventilator graphics are the most important aspects in ventilator management. You know, without ventilator graphics, I think we cannot manage any patient in the ICU. Graphics will be the rich source of pathophysiology of lung characteristics, and we can monitor the patient with the help of ventilator graphics. We can treat and see whether the patient is improving or not. So most of our management depends on mentored graphics. So we have uh, esteemed speaker, Dr. Shivangi Mishra, Associate Consultant, Muslim Darsha Medical Center, Naran Health City, Bengaluru. 
will discuss about mentor graphics over to you madam good evening everyone uh, thank you dr raghunath for the introduction uh, we will be discussing uh, ventilator graphics over the next few minutes ventilator graphics being a extensively extensive topic i will try to keep it as short as possible so ventilator graphics is basically a real time interpretation of the um, and graphical representation of the patient ventilator interaction it can be uh, it is represented in the form of scalars scalars are basically measured to variables plotted against time the measured variables being uh, the pressure flow and the volume Uh, expressed in the terms of centimeters water, liter flow being expressed as liters per minute, and volume as ml. Uh, volume expressed as ml. Similarly, there are loops. Loops are basically when the measured variables are plotted against each other. So we have flow volume loop and the pressure volume loops. When it comes to scalars, the scalars can be divided into phases. the phases uh, being uh, the trigger limit and cycle and these vary with the type of the ventilation we use the trigger can be in flow or pressure in assisted modes or it can be a time trigger in control modes similarly the limit can be volume or flow in the volume control modes or pressure in pressure control modes and uh, the cycle can be flow or time so coming to pressure time scaler it is one of the most important and most informative scaler which is used in uh, which is used uh, to as a ventilator graphic so the pressure time scaler can be a square wave pattern or an exponential the square wave pattern of the pressure time scaler is basically seen in the pressure of uh, ventilation pressure ventilation either being uh, either control or support in a volume control ventilation what we see is an exponential that is from the baseline there is an exponential rise in the pressure to reach the peak inspiratory pressure uh when it comes to differentiating between the assisted and controlled breaths the uh presence of a negative deflection helps us in distinguishing whether it is a assisted or controlled in a spontaneous breath the pressure time scaler will be a sine wave pattern so a uh, pressure time scaler uh, in a volume control ventilation can lead many other findings and many other parameters for uh, many other findings and many other parameters so uh, for that we need to apply inspiratory hold inspiratory hold is basically a status of no flow uh, where we see which causes equalization of pressure around the airway in the, uh, and it gives us up this uh, specific kind of graph so uh, in details if the similar graph can be in uh, seen as this so what we see here is the peak inspiratory pressure peak inspiratory pressure is basically the pressure generated in the airway the maximum pressure which can be generated in the airway it is uh, basically a uh, sum of the airway resistance pressure airway compliance pressure and the peak as we see in through the respiratory equation of motion that the airway pressure is represented by the airway resistance and the alveolar pressure which is a uh, uh, indicator of the compliance airway resistance pressure is in turn a uh, product of the flow and resistance of the airway uh, and the alveolar pressure is a combination of volume over compliance plus the peak which is applied so the peak inspiratory pressure becomes uh, uh, some of the flow uh, product of flow and resistance that is the resistance pressure plus a uh, volume over compliance and the peak hence uh, like we can see in this graph the peak airway pressure uh the next thing which we can see is the airway pressure so once we apply the uh, inspiratory hold the flow becomes zero and so what we can see is the airway compliance and it gives us a plateau pressure which becomes an indicator of the airway compliance there's another thing what we see here is a plateau decay plateau decay is basically there is a gradual drop in the plateau pressure over time 
which is seen uh, one is become, one reason is because of the slow dissipation uh, and pendular effect between the alveolus with uh, smaller time constant or longer time constant also dissipation of the energy between and work of breathing from the lungs and the chest wall and at the same time presence of any leak can also cause a flatter decay so uh, and after that what we see is the airway alveolar compliance so what we see in this graph uh, in the shaded area is basically the work of breathing required to overcome the uh, resistance and the other area is the work of breathing area under the graph is the work of breathing required to overcome the alveolar compliance so uh, the sum of this gives us the mean alveolar pressure uh, like Dr. Vimit has already discussed, so uh, basically when the difference between the peak airway pressure and the plateau pressure increases, our airway resistance increases. So uh, it can be seen in the cases with uh, uh, bronchospasm or tube block or tube kinking or secretions. Similarly, uh, if the plateau pressure, uh, the difference between peak pressure and plateau pressure is seen, but the plateau pressure increases, it is an uh, indicator of poor lung compliance. Like we had seen in the formula, basically plateau pressure is volume over compliance. So in case of inspiratory hold, when volume becomes static, uh, then uh, plateau pressure becomes in, uh, inversely proportional to the lung compliance. So as the plateau pressure increases, our compliance decreases. Okay, uh, now coming to cases in patients with COPD or in cases where the exhalation is not adequate, so or expiratory time is low. So the alveoli, they fail to expel the extra amount of the air, which causes a situation of autopy. And if the same expiratory time continues, the autopy keeps on increasing and the area under the curve increases, causing increased work of breathing. Also, uh, there's a concept of rise time, which we not, which we don't use very frequently. Basically, rise time is the uh, speed of or the uh, slope of increase in the peak airway pressure from the baseline. So, the optimal rise time, which we use and which should be used, should be around 100 to 200 milliseconds. But in cases uh, whether if it's too low or too high, both of them can be harmful. A too low uh, rise time can cause uh, what we see in this graph A is an exponential curve. Exponential curve will cause a slow rise in the pressure, but at the same time, it will decrease the tidal volume uh, uh, generated and it will increase our work of breathing. Uh, similarly, like we can see in the graph C, in the waveform C, uh, the, the rise time is too high, too steep. So that causes a beaking in the waveform and it causes increase in the airway pressures and increases the chances of battle trauma. So the pressure time scalars can be used in identifying the breath type delivered, adequacy of inspiratory flow, uh, adequacy of plateau, pressure waveform shape, um, the work of breathing, the breath timing, uh, then adequacy of static maneuvers and to uh, see look for airway trapping uh, air trapping and uh, look for adequacy in rise time. Coming to volume time scaler. Volume, this is the typical graph which we see for a volume time scaler. Uh, volume time scaler is basically most from um, main use is to identify the pressure of uh, presence of any air leak or uh, air trapping. So ideally the volume time curve should touch the baseline. If the volume time curve is not touching the baseline, uh, it indicates there's a loss of volume which can be contributed by air trapping or air leak. Coming to the flow time scalars, uh, this graph represents the typical flow time scalar, scalar which we see in different types of ventilation. So, in a control ventil volume control ventilation, what we see is generally is a constant flow. While in a pressure control ventilation, what is generally seen is a deaccelerating. So, uh, yeah. So uh, it is, uh, the, there are various phases, that is the inspiratory phase followed by inspiratory pause and the expiratory phase. Uh, each component has their own significance. Uh, like the presence of inspiratory pause 
uh, can help us in uh, if uh, there is uh, we are seeing an inspiratory pause and at the same time adequate uh, the targeted volume is delivered then we have a scope of increasing the inspiratory time and we can deliver further more volumes in the pressure control mode what we see that is the deaccelerating flow uh, so what happens is uh, uh, the cycling that is the flow cycle uh, it can when it's flow cycled so we target uh, around 25 per expir expiration at around 25 percent that is uh, when the flow reaches uh, uh, 25 percent of the peak then the expiratory cycle begins in a spontaneous spread the flow time cycle will have uh, flow time scale up it will have a sinusoidal waveform this is one of the again one of the common waveforms seen in uh, ICU city. Uh, this indicates a severe bronchospasm. In patient with severe bronchospasm, what happens is uh, with uh, minimal flow, we attain the uh, targeted peak pressures, and then and that's why the our volume delivered gets impacted. The exhalation part of the volume uh, flow time scalar uh, is also again important. Like in this uh, waveform, we can see ideally the exhalation should touch the baseline in the flow time scalar. But in this, uh, as we can see, it's not touching the baseline. This indicates the presence of again air trapping or leak. Similarly, the, pres uh, the peak expiratory flow and the duration of exhalation is uh, again significant. In this, if the peak expiratory flow is less or the exhalation time gets uh, increased, it is an uh, indicator of uh, obstructive air disease. And in this situation, if once uh, bronchodilators are applied, uh, the, we can see the uh, expiratory flow normalizes and even the expiratory time also normalizes. If there, we can see uh, notches in the uh, inspiratory part of the flow time scalar, that can be an indication of the patient efforts. So uh, the flow time scalar can be used to uh, assess the presence of air trapping, to see bronchodilator response, to see the trap of breath delivered, the adequacy of inspiratory time, adequacy of expiratory time, presence of asynchrony, and uh, whether there is any triggering is present or not. Coming to the pressure volume loops. So pressure volume loop is uh, basically a uh, representation of uh, uh, pressure over uh, volume, where uh, the pressure is represented in x-axis and uh, volume is represented in the y-axis. So in the spontaneous mode of ventilation, where uh, there is a negative inspiratory effort is there, we see the inspiratory part of the curve on the negative side of uh, uh, the uh, graph and expiratory on the positive side. But in case of assisted mode, we see what is uh, known as a trigger tail. So uh, after a trigger tail, uh, again, the curve uh, moves towards the positive side of the graph with the inspiratory curve represented on the right side and expiratory curve represented on the left side. And again, in control mode, uh, we see the same inspiratory curve on the right side and expiratory on the left. So these are the various parts of the pressure volume. Uh, we see the loop after uh, peep, if the peep is applied. Uh, then the initial part of the loop is represents the alveolar recruitment. So basically, there's something known as lower infliction point, as has already been discussed with Dr. Harish. Uh, basically, a lower infliction point is the point when the alveoli starts getting recruited. So uh, all the compliance of the curve is seen in the part of the loop which is with parallel sides. After that, what we see is B gain, that is over distension. So what happens in this part of the curve, in our uh, pressure is increasing despite the volume being static. So it is uh, basically causing over distension. Uh, this is followed by the upper inflection point, which is uh, the point from where the over distension starts. So uh, this is the waveform which we see in the volume control 
kind of a ventilation for pressure volume groups which you see. So basically what is happening here is uh, the green shade is uh, showing a normal compliance. But in case uh, when the, the, the patient is requiring higher airway pressures to deliver the same volume, it denotes that the patient in the, in the presence of reduced compliance. Similarly, if the patient is requiring low airway pressures to, de, uh, to deliver similar amount of volume, it increases increased compliance, which can be seen in conditions like m The same representation in a pressure control ventilation uh, these loops, uh, uh, the green loop determines the normal compliance, while the while the uh, blue uh, pink loop denotes uh, reduced compliance, where uh, denotes uh, increased compliance, and the blue loop denotes the reduced compliance. So. Uh, application uh, where we can use a pressure volume loop is to assess the work of breathing, changes in compliance and resistance, uh, seeing the mode of ventilation, lung, whether there's any over distension or not, seeing, looking for the peak uh, flow rate, and whether there's any air leak or air trapping. So like in this graph, we can see that there's an evidence of full lung over distension. In this loop, this is basically showing hysteresis, that is uh, the increase in resistance, airway resistance. Here, what we can see is the pressure volume loop is not touching uh, the baseline. So there is presence of the uh, air leak. Coming to the flow volume loops. So flow volume loop is basically when flow is uh, plotted against the volume. Uh, here, what we can see is uh, the difference between the spontaneously breathing patient and the mechanically breathing patient. So, in a spontaneously breathing patient uh, with a negative inspiratory effort, the inspiratory part of the curve is seen on the negative side, and uh, uh, the expiration is seen on the positive side, while it's completely inverse in the mechanically ventilated patient. So, uh, the flow volume loops can be used to assess the air leak, air traffic, to detect any bronchodilator response, and to assess the airway, re uh, airway resistance. So, uh, airway resistance can be assessed by the peak expiratory flow rate. In this uh, uh, flow volume loop, what we can see that the expiratory flow rate is reduced. Uh, along with that, we can see a scooping in the expiratory side of the curve, which is uh, seen in cases of every, uh, in bronchial asthma or obstructive airway disease. Uh, this flow volume loop shows uh, the, that the uh, presence of an air leak. Because the uh, flow volume, volume loop touches the baseline uh, before the expiratory and inspiratory part of the curve, they are not uh, touching the baseline at the same point. So there is a loss of volume and it indicates the presence of an air leak. Similarly, uh, this uh, flow volume loop, again, the flow is not touching the baseline. So the patient is not able to uh, exhale out all the, uh, all the entrapped air and it indicates air trapping. Presence of secretions in the airway uh, causes uh, uh, notching in the expiratory part of the loop. And uh, what we can, that's what we can see here. Coming to ventilator asynchrony, uh, the ventilator asynchrony can be trigger related, flow related, or cycle related. The trigger asynchrony can be auto trigger, double trigger, ineffective trigger. Flow related can be flow mismatch or inadequate pressure, and cycle can be premature cycling and delayed cycling. So, uh, in this graph, what we can see is auto triggering. Auto triggering is commonly seen with presence of leak in the circuit, or if there's presence of secretions, or water in the circuit, or uh, with cardiac oscillations. So, uh, minimizing the leak is the best way to, or addressing the primary cause, primary pathology, if there's a cardiac pathology, that has to be addressed to uh, reduce that. Uh, this waveform is uh, showing something known as double triggering. Double triggering happens when there are two breaths are delivered within the same inspiratory time. So uh, this, uh, what we can do here is increase the inspiratory time, mechanical inspiratory time delivered to the patient. The main reason for double triggering is flow mismatch. So increasing flows or uh, increasing the mechanical inspiratory time will help in reducing the double triggering. 
what we see here is ineffective efforts. Ineffective efforts is uh, mostly because of the low restrictive diet, or it can be uh, because when a uh, patient is getting nebulized, when there is extra flows are delivered to the circuit, it causes ineffective efforts. Basically, whatever patient uh, is generating efforts is not get, uh, followed by a breath delivered by the ventilator. Uh, this is uh, shows the presence of flow mismatch. So basic flow mismatch or air hunger. So basically what we see here is in the pressure time curve. In a volume control ventilation and a pressure time curve, uh, concavity is, the, is seen in the uh, rises uh, in the pressure time scalar. So uh, increasing flows, decreasing the inspiratory time, or using a uh, pressure control mode of ventilation can help us with this flow mismatch. In adequate pressure, so uh, in the patients with uh, pressure control ventilation, uh, candle backing seen in the flow time scalar can uh, indi di indicates the presence of high inspiratory demand or that the pressure which has to, which is being delivered to the patient is not adequate. So increasing the pressure in these cases will help, helps in reducing the sensitivity. Premature cycling, uh, when the inspiratory time is too low, uh, uh, or the, in which, because of which the airway, uh, the required tidal volume is not delivered to the patient, and it increases the peak airway pressures as well. Uh, increasing the respiratory, increasing the inspiratory time helps in the, uh, reducing the premature cycling. This is the delayed cycling. Basically, what we see is uh, uh, spiking at the end of the inspiration in the pressure time scalar. Uh, the inspiratory time is not adequate uh, for uh, the patient. Increasing the inspiratory time helps in uh, uh, reducing this. So that's all with uh, ventilator graphics. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shivangi. Uh, it was very basics of uh, you know flow uh, loops and uh, scalars. Uh, yeah, I think we'll take questions later. Uh, I will request for the next panelist to uh, introduce the next speaker. Uh, thank you, Raghunath. Uh, that is a wonderful talk. Uh, we will go on to the next talk by Dr. Govinda Rajan, who is a, uh, our friend uh, from USA. He's the Director of Clinical Affairs and he's Operations Officer for Operating Rooms. And uh, he is also a member of the executive leadership in Los Angeles. And I'm thankful for him to have consented uh, to talk to us about the uh, challenges in developing indigenous ventilators, which was the crux of the problem during the pandemic. And with that, I request Dr. Uh, Govindarajan to present his uh, uh, topic on challenges in developing uh, ventilators during pandemic. Dr. Mm -hmm. Govindarajan. Hey, thank you, Dr. Muralithar, for the invite. And actually, just like I said, I'm trying to share my screen. I'm trying to see if somebody will have to unshare their screen so that I can scare it. I share it. Uh, it says I can't share my screen. You yes, can. yes, you can. you can. Now I can. Okay, there you go. Thank you, thank you. You guys are the best. Okay, here you go. Can you guys see my screen? We can, we can. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. And you guys are all aware of what happened in pandemic. I will give you a little uh, runoff as to how we got involved and how we got all sucked into this. It was, I think, uh, the early, early days, I think it's 2020. I think in January, we started hearing some kind of a trigger that there's something really bad happening in China. From China, it start, they talked about it's probably going to come to the U.S. And we thought that in the U.S., it's never going to be a problem because the U.S. has all the resources. Everything is there. There's a lot of money, lots of hospitals, a lot of specialty care. Everything was good. But then we started hearing something terrible happening in, in, in Europe, especially in uh, England. 
And that's when we start getting really worried. And then when it hit New York, that's when for the first time uh, we started really talking about it. And it was like 20, 24 seven media was talking about like you know, the ventilator shortages and people being put on uh, ventilators and, and that they don't have the ventilators and you know the oxygen supply is running out and they're splitting the ventilators and people are trying to figure out how to somehow just provide care for this overwhelmingly sick population which was showing up to, uh, at the hospitals. The worst was uh, the story which was coming out of Madrid, which actually looked like uh, there were patients who were dying, who needed to be, in, who were intubated, but could not be ventilated. And the biggest risk was uh, if you intubate a patient and you can't, you don't have a ventilator and you throw the patient on the ambu bag, somebody's got to squeeze that bag. And you can imagine in situations where you are actually exposed, uh, you are be, you know, you're being asked to be so close to someone who actually has COVID and you are not protected, it's not a good thing. Nonetheless, I was working in the operating room at that time and there's a friend of mine who's a bio, uh, who's got a background in biotechnology and he walked into me and he, we started chatting about it and the CNN was running all these uh, you know, deadly stories about ventilator shortages all over the world. And he said, uh, and we start talking about it. And I said, like when I used to be in India and that was almost 30 years ago, uh, I was in South Jang. I'm, I'm a graduate of Maranadad Medical College and I was in South Jang at ICU. So uh, New Delhi and, and I still go back. Uh, but the interesting thing was that in India at that time, when I was actually doing my post-graduation and I was a registrar, I used to routinely go and intubate patients on, in the hospital and the hospital is a busy hospital. And they will call the, somebody having a spirit says you go into bed, but you don't have ICU bed. So what did we do? We actually threw, told the family member to squeeze the bag till the uh, ICU bed became available. And that was what I told this friend of mine. I said, like, this is what we did when we had went into the shortage, but it looks like here the challenges are a little different. And that if we have to create a ventilator, we may have to create a ventilator on a short term and the challenges, the moment, but the bigger problem was they were, uh, you know, the government was saying, oh, we got the money. We're going to ask all these big companies to start making ventilators and stuff, but there were no uh, supplies available. The supply chain all over the world was actually totally broken. And from that came, you know, the ventilators uh, that we got involved in. So the idea was pretty simple. We just were brainstorming as to what can be done. And he said, like, you know, if, a human being cannot squeeze the bag, can a machine squeeze the bag? And from that uh, discussion. So COVID-19, I think every, everyone knows like you know, by now it's airborne and it usually is mild to moderate in some parts of the world in some situations basically cause tremendous mortality. And uh, I think uh, everybody is quite aware that immunocompromised and elderly uh, were the highest at risk. And later on, now we are realizing it's even patients who are, you know, uh, overweight and have other comorbidities. They are also high risk, uh, being on put, being hospitalized, being on ventilators, and uh, you know, and lining up dead. The mortality in the United States and in the uh, Western Europe was un, uh, disproportionately much higher than it was in. Uh, India and the rest of the world. And we don't know whether it's reporting issues or it's because the immune system or immune mechanisms are different or the variants that they got inflicted with were different. So we know what the ventilator is. And in the last four excellent talks, people talk about like, you know, all that the ventilator can do, but these are all sophisticated ventilators. They're hugely, you know, they are very expensive to put together. And uh, we know, uh, uh, that in patients uh, with COVID who were developing severe respiratory distress and ARDS, they needed me mechanical ventilators. Of course, uh, the jury is still out as far as um, you know the discussion about whether ventilators really help or not. We don't know yet. And people, there are people who say like they do, and there are people who would say they don't. And, but overall, most of the people would love not to put a patient in a ventilator because if you go on a ventilator, you tend to die. And a lot of patients actually died. Uh, the, in the, the interesting thing is like at that point in time, we we're talking about like, you know, I was also working on developing a low cost ECMO and trying to see if, you know, that would actually be helpful. But the data until today in my hospital at least is pretty terrible in respect to ECMO on COVID patients. And uh, 
uh, almost comparable. Whether you get intubated or ECMO, the outcome is pretty much the same. So we know that the system was getting overwhelmed and the idea pretty much was that ambu bags may be able to mitigate the demand because A, the ambu bags were available. A uh, dime a dozen, especially in the United States and Western Europe, like here, the requirement is like, if you are, in, in, you know, in every OR has an ambu bag, every ICU bed has an ambu bag, an ambu bag every floor has ambu, so we had lots of ambu bags. Uh, so that was not the problem. But the bigger problem basically was, <laughs> the infectivity, if somebody has to squeeze the bag for long periods of time, they or whosoever is squeezing would get exposed. And uh, because of the high infectivity and um, you know the fear factor which was involved with COVID-19. So this is what we came up with. Anyway, I'm gonna just go past a little faster here. Uh, the idea was basically to create a bridge ventilator. So I was on a vacation and uh, the discussion came up like, you know, how to make a ventilator and uh, out of the ambu bag. So first and foremost question is, can ambu bag be converted into an ambu and into a ventilator? That was first question. The second question basically was, how do you actually mechanize it to make sure that it actually is available and can be mass produced? And these were the two big challenges. And so what we did was we recruited a uh, an in, a biomedical engineer, uh, you know, uh, mechanical engineer from University of Texas, uh, Austin, Texas, and he's now the chief of BLI. So we put together a consortium and the consortium went online. And uh, I came up with, because I had done it in the past, that was the only reason I was able to do it. So I came up with a, uh, so this is, some, this is the timeline pretty much. And if you look at this timeline, you'll realize like, you know, we went really fast. But the single biggest challenge we had was the supply. We wanted, we knew there are tons and tons of engineers who are all over the world who are actually not doing anything because of COVID and COVID shutdown. What we did not know is what, resources they have available to them to be able to deliver uh, you know, a working ventilator. Uh, we also knew that all these sophisticated ventilators have thousands of parts in them and those parts are not readily available. Most of them are basically you know, stuck in ships and other places. So it was becoming a very uh, crazy situation for us. So we came up with the idea that, you know what? We're gonna use the wiper motors, you know, wiper motors uh, in uh, uh, wiper blades in cars. So wiper motors actually are very sustained motors. So this friend of mine basically said, you know, these wiper motors, if we take these wiper motors and start basically using them and use the engineering skills to somehow work through the system, we might be able to pull off a ventilator, which actually can uh, be use worthy. That was just the start of the idea. And so now how do you, get you know the information out so what we did was i went on to i'm going to go to the next i went on to basically create a uh a youtube and uh, you know media post and that was actually uh, how to convert an ambu bag into a bridge ventilator and i gave all the design for the open design it basically put out in detail how if an engineer really wanted to do it he could actually do it on dime <clears throat> and on a, on a, in a really cheap way of course, all these resources have to be uh, local because supply chains were broken. The, the interesting thing was this response we got out of this was unprecedented. I put it out in the Facebook and I put it on the engineering site. So these, all these engineers from all over the world, including India, IIT, Kanpur, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Bandopadhyay, he has got an incubator center in India. In India, actually we did, we made ventilators and there are thousands of ventilators which are in use as a result of that. But we also made ventilators in Africa. Uh, but in Africa, we ran a challenge and we basically had a third party fund the challenge because there they did not have ambu bags. In, 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 uh, there are parts of Africa where not only they don't have ambu bags, they also don't have oxygen and they also don't have ventilators. So it's, it was like pretty scary. Uh, but in the United States, what we did went on to do was to hook up with, I'm going to go on to the next one. So this was the video kind of thing which basically put, we, we, we put out in which you know, various parts of the, and this is, this is all we are doing. We are explaining it to the engineers, which is they are the ones who are actually the forefront of putting it all together because I can't do it. I can just tell them like what needs to be done and how it can be done. So we explain all these kind of things and it takes a while for them to understand any of this, trust me. And, and it was a challenge. So having explained all these kind of things, this is just a video which basically, you know, how we played it for them. 
once that was all done, we got to work. And so University of Texas, the engineers, they took up the challenge. So they started prototyping it. And these are the prototypes that you're looking at. And in the UCI, this was a prototype that they started working on it. So, you know, at UCI, we started working on it. And I got a call from the, you know, Richard Branson. Richard Branson is the big philanthropic, you know, he has Virgin Galactic and Virgin Orbit. He's the one who's sending rockets into uh, space. So he has a company which is not very really far from where I actually practice and it's called Virgin Orbit. And his CEO got a call from the governor of California that they need help because now California was getting into serious trouble and they were forth, they were uh, projecting that they might actually have see severe shortfalls on ventilators. So they came and joined our consortium and they offered their services. And guess what, what came out of that was just, just fantastic. Those guys put 24 seven, 365, all their engineers, these are all rocket engineers. You see all these ventilators, these ventilators were made in a matter of from, from conception to design. These are very sophisticated ventilators. This, it, even though it's ambu bag based, there's an ambu bag in it and it basically squeezes. But the key is of this ventilator is it does everything. It actually applies beep. It give, you can control tidal volume. You can control IE ratio. It has all the alarms built into it. This was all done in less than three weeks. So if I were to go back and show you the timeline, actually. Okay, wait a minute, I just need to go back. If you look at the timeline here, this is actually interesting. March 13th is when we start talking about it. And March 24th is when we created this card source video, we published it. By 30th, we got hold of Virgin Orbit. This is a big company. They make rocket, but they were actually doing nothing. All the engineers were sitting and twiddling their thumbs. And it took us from this to April 23rd. That's when we got FDA approved for the emergency use authorization of the ventilator. This is actually a ambu bag. The idea basically was to, if you were to, you could use this ventilator on patients, uh, then other high-end ventilators could actually be available for this, the sickest and the sick patients. That was the primary driver uh, of uh, putting it all together. So overall, we eventually landed up making around 600 and gave it to the stockpile in California. We sent some to Africa and they are still being used in South Africa and some other places. Uh, but of course, now they are all, you know, the rest of the sophisticated ventilator industry has caught up. So there's no need to do that. In India, on the other hand, uh, we did much better because uh, during the same time I was in contact with the directorate, uh, director of science and technology, Dr. Ash, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Ashutosh Sharma, and he, is, uh, he holds a purse. And they were actually having a difficult time trying to figure it out, like, you know, what they should be doing in India. And so I, I was in touch with the, the professor at IIT Kanpur, Dr. Bandapadhyay. And we all got together and, you know, uh, in India, because the resources in India is different. Uh, I was, it was interesting that India does not have as many ambu bags per capita as the rest of the world. So there they actually came up with a, a different kind of a ventilator and uh, that ventilator eventually went on to make a company and they made, I think they've already made thousands of ventilators and they are in service. So it was one of the most fascinating thing I, from my perspective as for, you know, and I'm an innovator, I, I, I make products and do all these kind of things was that when people get together and they actually talk and people of different expertise come together, they can make things happen really fast. I was surprised at the expertise of the people uh, that in the medical community, we don't even know uh, that those kind of things can be done. Uh, there, was, there was a scientist from NASA, he joined our consortium and he was telling us like what they can do. There was one guy who came from Northam Grumman, and he's actually a microwave tech, you know, he's an engineer in microwave uh, engineering. And he told us like, you know, how he can use microwave to actually cook the virus. And I said like, really? And he told us like how specifically engineers can actually do that. So I'm surprised. So one of the biggest takeaway for me was that the interface between medical technology or medicine and what we need in medicine and the rest of the engineers or the science and technology industry, the gap in information is huge. 
they don't know what we need actually a lot of times. And, and that was the biggest takeaway. So what we did in the end of the day, like, you know, it was a good experience. We were able to accomplish what we accomplished. I learned a lot, but the biggest uh, thing I, we did was we went on to basically write a book. And this was a book basically was written for, this was a book which was written for the, sorry. Uh, this was a book which was written for uh, the engineers, uh, for the from physicians actually. So, and our idea was so that they understood our needs. I think there are many more books that needs to be written by physicians for the engineers and for these old scientists and stuff like that. So they can actually understand like what we need so they can actually jump on to solve our problems. Uh, a lot of it is basically stuck up in patents and you know uh, intellectual property and everything else. And you know patients are really not getting the benefit of it. Uh, that's my take. Anyway, at this point in time, I will stop and take questions. Uh, but thank you again, Dr. Molidhar for having me on and being able to share uh, uh, this ex modest experience that we've had. Uh, thank you, Govindarajan. That was absolutely fantastic how you developed the ventilator, taking the help of the science and technology people. Very well done. Very fascinating and uh, impressive uh, way you have worked with them to develop this ventilator. Within three weeks, you developed and uh, it could be a be approved in such a quick fashion. That's really amazing. And uh, I should say it's an incredible story. Thank you for that. No, that thank you. Uh, thank you. This was the biggest thing. Like on the, 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 the whole world was uh, needing a ventilator yes. at that point in time. But uh, uh, it was, it was uh, very uh, heartwarming to see all these people with you know, great skills come together. Absolutely. It's a very rewarding experience. And with this, I will open the forum for uh, question and answers and comments. Uh, can I request all the panelists to come on the video, switch on their videos and unmute their mics and uh, have a sort of a discussion next 10, 15 minutes, please. To set the ball rolling, I will ask Arjun, uh, what is the commonest mode of ventilation you use in your ICU? Do you have uh, uh, a set uh, pattern of ventilating patients when you know that it's a, uh, uh, when you initiate the ventilators, ventilatory therapy, I mean to say. Dr. Arjun, can you unmute and come on the video? Do you want to say anything? You want to make any comments or any questions? Feel free. I think Arjun uh, is not there, sir. He's not there? Question, yeah. Okay, I'll ask you a question because you guys are yes, all. Yes, yes. I, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question, all of you. And, yes. and the question basically is because I think, uh, Harish, you were actually, when you, you were presenting your uh, talk, you did mention. Uh, pulmonary and extra pulmonary ARDS. Okay, that concept has not caught up, but and very few people actually know about that concept. People all, most of the people actually have experience with what's called ARDS and they pretty much have an extra pulmonary ARDS that they have actually been dealing with. And most of the studies that actually we use to uh, do, uh, make, you know, uh, deductions on like how to treat these patients is based off, off of extra pulmonary uh, ARDS. Uh, I usually call them type A and type B ARDS. My type B ARDS, in fact, I put in a LinkedIn post, the moment ARDS, the moment COVID hit, I put a post in LinkedIn to basically make people be aware of the fact that the one ARDS that we are actually experiencing or we're going to be facing is type B ARDS, which is exactly what you said, which is the pulmonary ARDS, which actually requires a different kind of a ventilatory strategy. So I want to get your take on, like, you know, any of you, 
because you actually have been in the gators of taking care of these patients. Did you actually change your strategy of ventilating these patients because you were aware that this is actually a pulmonary ARDS, which is different from an extra pulmonary ARDS? Definitely. Um, so that is uh, what our thought process in the beginning of uh, COVID ARDS management, even uh, Gettinoni also put a paper on that understanding uh, we need a different modality of ventilation. So don't keep on uh, trying to recruit or keep on increasing the PEEP uh, in a patient who had a pulmonary or a primary ARDS, what we got in the COVID and all. Uh, but down the line, see that concept has bit faded up because so as we proceed, uh, yeah, yeah, with the, with the, with the, uh, the disease progression and all. So what initially the good compliant lung uh, may become a non-compliant also. Uh, whatever the initial concept of our understanding, okay, uh, like uh, this is the COVID ARDS will entirely uh, behave in a different way. So again, uh, there are lots of in and around controversies arising, but definitely when we start our ventilator therapy, so to just to jump on, uh, like recruitability or going upon uh, high PEEP as compared to that of a patient who had a extra pulmonary RDS may not fit always in a pulmonary RDS. Lots of data available before COVID also. And not only just ventilating modalities, lots of molecular uh, level, some sort of research happening in terms of targeting therapy uh, on the basis of etiological uh, factor which created the RDS and all. So that we yeah. need to. So even, no, even. No, so just, just, to, just to add on to that. Yes. Uh, yes. yes uh, during the second wave and even during the third wave, actually, when it comes to the ventilation, unfortunately, we did not change the ventilator strategy. We have been using the same strategy that we used on H1N1. Uh, hey, but question, uh, the, who's talking actually? Who's yeah, sorry. Uh, this is Vimal, sir. I'm so sorry. Okay, okay. okay. I, I, yeah, yeah, so, uh, okay, yeah. Please switch on yes. the video. Yeah. yeah, there is a poor network, so I'm unable to switch on the video. It is... Uh, uh, so, the, the uh, so I had a word, uh, we had some discussions with the Canadians. The, mm -hmm. uh, interestingly, there, the APRV TCAM mode during the third wave showed phenomenally better results. And uh, probably physiologically and theoretically, once you look at the APRV TCAM mode, it might be a better strategy to avoid ventilator-induced lung injury. Although the trials are missing, but this, their, their center experience was phenomenal. And uh, they and were of Vimal, the Why that, would that be the case? Why, why would you think that would be the case? Yeah, why because... Would they, uh, yeah, what, what would yeah. be the physiological benefit of it? In, uh, uh, because in, the... Uh, one more overlooked strategy is that the shear stress or yes, how the alveoli yeah. alveoli uh, are subjected to the shear stress is, uh, is not changed with the conventional modes of ventilation. But once we go for an APRV TCAM mode, mm -hmm. most of the shear stress is taken care of, which is right. the most undermined uh, entity and which can lead to biotrauma. Everyone speaks about barotrauma, volutrauma, atlectotrauma, but no one speaks about the biotrauma or the organ-to-organ -organ interaction causing multi-organ failure. So the shear True. stress causing cytokine release might be one of mm -hmm. the prime pathologies of COVID uh, pneumonia per se, which would have led yeah. to bad results. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things that came out of this was I was talking to someone you know, during this consortium and one person, and our my own take has been with ARDS has been that whenever lungs are the primary reason like that means you can have injury from the vessel to the lung which is what the extra pulmonary ARDS is or you can have a primary alveolar interface injury which is viral smoke inhalation you know acid aspiration and stuff like that what i've realized over the years is whenever i put these patients which are actually getting the primary pulmonary uh, you know ARDS on any kind of ventilators i I think anything which would basically decrease the inspiratory stretch, anything that would basically, which is what APR we do, like you know, it would basically increase the inspiratory time to the fact that the stretch is so slow versus you know the fast stress and you know good, and I think that probably has something to do with this benefit that Canadians are actually 
getting. But to your other, other point is basically the moment you actually have an injured alveoli over the stent, it will basically cause a lot of injury and that injury basically leads to cytokine storms. And that's what basically Italians were talking about. Like, you know, what Harish, you mentioned that, uh, you know, these patients did not do very well early on. Yes. So one more point on EPRV. See, basically, like it operates at the high pressure for high time and a low pressure and low time and all. That a low time is very brief. It will not allow the alveoli to totally emptied. So there will some effect. So it prevents like the complete collapse of the alveoli. That time is very, very low. It is hardly around 0.6 to 0.8 not more than a second and uh, there was a trial started on APRV called protect trial but unfortunately mm -hmm. i think um, like not out yet so we need to get an idea uh, with this rationality of working principle is it going to be proven on paper and all but definitely it is but one more the problem with the problem with that particular trial is that they if you look at the people who have been recruited yeah. the recruitment is you have to basically have a trial which basically says Extrapulmonary versus intrapulmonary. Yeah, and yeah. unless the etiology is separate, you cannot basically use a modes which are interdependent. That's one reason why we have not been able to make any progress in ARDS and ARDS related mortality and morbidity in more, a lot of these patients. Because we have not been able to actually say, okay, fine, X patients we're going to deal with differently and Y patients deal differently. And uh, but recruitment yeah. is a mass recruitment. It is not specified either a primary or a secondary ARDS kind Ooh. of. Yeah. And yeah, I think we are using the same the different terminologies saying the same thing, but yeah, you're right. Unless you actually do. Yeah, etiology specific, uh, some sort of ventilatory and non ventilatory modalities. Uh, interventions are coming maybe in the uh, like coming days. Uh, we need to look for more and more options in that area, definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anybody yeah. has any good ideas, uh, any good uh, experience with ECMO and survival? You're talking about partial ECMO. And any COVID patients we're talking about. Because in our institution, when we put patients on protect duo or if you don't leave the ECMOs or ECMOs per se, we did not. But on the other hand, selectively two or three patients who had smoke inhalation injury and or acid aspiration injury to the find that they were actually almost dying. They were people of 20 you talk. We put them on ECMO and they walked. So it was like, this patient was 100% dying and we just put them on ECMO and the person walked. Yeah, yeah. And then we had the ARDS patient putting, with COVID patients we are putting on ECMO and they're all dying. Is it the timing? Uh, probably, so this is Vimal again. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so probably the timing is the key uh, on, the, on the patient selection. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, just to add on to that APR, we just wanted to uh, really excited to share the news that we will we are going to be a part of an international trial on APR V TCAM mode uh, with Canada, Poland, USA, and uh, uh, mm -hmm. and Germany. And along with with us being the lead center, we are about to put it across to the ethical committee next month uh, for nice. being one of the centers for lead study. This is for all the ARDS patients since the COVID recruitment is less. Uh, so hope so that we... Yeah, that's we might when it's going to probably fail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of case reports of awake ECMO being better mm -hmm. with regards yeah. to uh, the COVID ARDS scenario because the ventilator induced lung injury is, is close to nothing over there in awake ECMO. So oh, most of, what, so, yeah. yes, although there is One a patient. theoretical, there is a theoretical or the, uh, some intensivists might argue that self-inflicted lung injury can be a problematic uh, scenario. But once the patient is spontaneously breathing, the nature will will automatically adjust itself to uh, mm -hmm. to direct the air into which alveolus is is better suited for. So that that might really curb the biotrauma. Yeah, possible that, is, that is true. Actually, one we are, yeah. yes, that actually we are reporting that awake ECMO in one of our papers, which is getting published now, and also hmm. in COVID nineteen the routine. Uh, the typical acute ARDS may not be seen because some of the problems in COVID-19 is because of the pulmonary vasculature involvement, thrombosis mm -hmm. occurring there and hypoxemia. So the typical treatment of acute uh, ARDS in a COVID patient 
has to be tailor made to a given particular case what is the leading pathology in that case and then we should be able to um, adjust the ventilatory parameters the blanket uh, ARDS treatment protocol may not be applicable to all patients of COVID-19. Interestingly, one thing you find, we found was that most of the patients who were actually hospitalized, intubated with COVID and or, you know, they did not have, they were, they were COVID, they were COVID negative on the 10th or the 12th day. So they did right. not have COVID anymore. Right. So, right. so essentially what was happening was that we were the ones who were actually, their disease was the ventilator, their disease was the doctors, their disease was the ICU. <laughs> yeah, because like you're talking about, like, you know, we are right now doing early trichotomies and, you know, uh, uh, yeah. on patients. Yeah. and uh, yeah, I just want to know, like, you know, if anybody has good stories, but we, we had probably one patient who actually, you know, had to eventually, he was young, so we just kept on with him and went on to basically get lung transplants. Uh, but otherwise, it's been, uh, it, ECMOS has, has been just as bad as ventilators. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I agree with that. We consciously and, did not put COVID patients on ECMO having known that the results were not as good. Mm -hmm. So only in desperate situations we tried them and we didn't have a um, good results, I should say. But I think a lot of it has got to do with, you know, the timing like Vimal was saying. Like, yes, you know, yes, yes. The patient has to earn a ECMO, right? The patient has to earn an ECMO. By the time the lungs are totally trashed, by the time you get it. And I think uh, the people who are actually getting a little excited about, you know, ECMOs, uh, or now that ECMO is becoming a little more fashionable and is easily available, just like ventilators. Yes. I think, uh, you know, put, there was one patient, what we did was a patient was young and he was getting a little bad. We put the patient on ECMO, like ECMO, we don't, we don't, Canlaws went in, even when he, as when the person, you know, the pulmonologist was saying it's time to intubate him. And yes. uh, it was actually really good because he went into what you call partial ECMO. And he did so, all right. So. <laughs> actually, COVID was, uh, Dr. Kanchi will vouch for me, that COVID mm -hmm. period was a time in India when uh, people were just going crazy about the latest technology or the latest uh, scientific paper that came. So they were crazy about remdesivir and then they were crazy about plasma mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. the ECMO. So the ones who could afford it, they would just be ringing up the hospital. Do you have ECMO mm -hmm. in your hospital? Yes, yes. So that's how it was. And a terrible period, terrible period, of course. It was oh, yeah. The only reason I, I'm more interested in getting the Indian perspective is because in India, if you have the money, you actually can get it. Like in the rest of the world, the person has to buy it because if there's no indication, they won't do it because the risk of getting litigated, yes. litigation risk is very high in high mortality. Right. Right. But in, in India, least, like, you know, if somebody has the money, you could actually argue and he may actually be able to get, you know, a, a preemptive <laughs> ECMO, right? <laughs> I was trying to find out, like, you know, did anybody yes. do it and did they have any results which were actually encouraging? Yes. And the credit of making it more popular goes to goes to some extent to our uh, um, uh, Jayalalitha Madam, Chief Minister to the previous Chief Minister of Tamil mm -hmm. Nadu. Mm -hmm. After that, uh, everybody wanted to know what is it more and do, do does your hospital have it more? Was the questions asked, and mm -hmm. people would go to a hospital where the ECMO facility was available. Oh, so absolutely. that that was the situation. It was like. Yeah. Any other comments before we can conclude? It's already nine past nine. Jacob, you want to say anything? I think uh, it was an interesting, uh, I mean, way of going things. Dr. Govindaraj, very impressed about the way the human yeah. factor goes above everything, combined together, and you got the call from uh, Virgin Atlantic because this, this indicates the, 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 when the, the, the unity you know, when, when it comes to that. And, and very impressed that you have created something which changed the treatment uh, in, in, in many parts of the world. And we never know. These things may, yeah. be, may be useful no, in the coming years because it's going to be the viral, or the pandemic or the viral disease era which is, which is right. facing right. it. Right now. I think this, the, what, what, what I learned from it is not so much as to whether we were able to do something which was actually useful or not. It was amazing as to how you actually can use the power of social media and right. the people's goodwill to actually help to come up with you know and they break all barriers like this was one so okay. nobody cared like you know that hey i i got an intellectual property i got to protect and i learned so much 
from this. Like there are people who will come in and they say, hey, methylene blue. I didn't know that yes. methylene blue actually is used in convalescent, convalescent plasma as a photo, oh. uh, you know, uh, activator to deactivate viruses. It's, it's like oh. the things that I learned from all these people who basically came on, the blue light and how blue light can actually de 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 deactivate the viruses and the, in Cedar Sinai next where we are, uh, within our consortium, the idea came up and they basically made what is called a endoscope, which would basically go and it basically throws blue light, a UV light to basically fry and you know, reduce the viral load in the nasal and all these passages and stuff like that. So people are doing all crazy stuff, but the technology is there, we just don't know. Yes, it's yes, like, yes. You know, yes. The, the, way, the, the best way to say it is Impala. Is that Impala device that you guys use? Guess Impala. where it came from? Yes, it came yes. from NASA. Because oh. NASA basically was fighting to a big challenge. And the challenge was how to basically create an injector for their rockets. So they wanted an Impala device and they made it. And then the cardiologist basically took it and that's what we are using as an Impala device right Right, right. Very yeah. interesting. Very so yeah, the, interesting. our NASA guy came and he said that they shared it and that's how the technology basically went out. Thank you. Thank you for the information. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Ratan, Thank you very much, want to say and everybody else. Yeah, Ratan, do you want to say anything? Uh, one learning uh, from the pandemic was a lot of uh, uh, non-intensivists, non-anesthetists were involved in patient care, especially the surgical colleagues. Yeah, so, yeah. And, uh, they stopped pestering us uh, whenever <laughs> we use NIV and they, they were not insisting uh, to have a PO to going more than 100. That's correct. That's a great <laughs> achievement. <laughs> Anup, do you want to say anything? No, sir, nothing more. Like we have discussed, I think, almost all uh, important points. Raghunath, how about Raghunath? Uh, yeah, uh, pandemic really helped the critical <laughs> specialist actually because community started understanding there is somebody special. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. yes. All the time, take the you know, advice. That's right. Uh, I think we have come to the end of the session. I would request uh, before I thank all my colleagues. Jacob Burkis, Ratan Gupta, Anup, and Raghunath, and all the speakers, Arjun, Harish, Vimal, Shivangi, and Dr. Govindar Rajan. I will uh, request uh, Dr. Jayashree Sood, who is the president of uh, CEO of the Indian College of Anesthesiologists, to say a vote of thanks, and then we will disperse for our dinners. Dr. Jay Shri uh, thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kanchi. Thank you very much. And uh, good evening, everybody. I've uh, been listening to the webinar since uh, 7 o'clock, since it started. And today, Dr. Murli, we've had such an extensively covered, of course, the first module, but done so well. And I'd like to, of course, once again, thank Dr. Jacob, Dr. Ratan, Dr. Anoop, and Dr. Raghunath for their moderation, and Dr. Arjun, Harish, Vimal, Shivangi, and Dr. Govind Rajan uh, for their lectures. Uh, there was a lot of interaction and thank you so much. We learned a lot and uh, we hope to see you again. I see Dr. Anup Kumar quite a few times in our webinars. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> so yes. we uh, meet on the 18th and uh, Dr. Kanchi, that would be module two or is it something else? No, module two will be next month. Next month. Next, next month, month, right. Next. So. Right. So I think we have the program coming now for the, okay, it's on neuromuscular monitoring. So hoping to uh, meet you all next Wednesday, same time, seven o'clock. And again, to remind you that our 100th century webinar will be held on the 15th of June. Yes. We'll be getting the reminders every time. That's a very Thank important you. topic on simulation. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so and thank, thank you, you Sanish, for always being there. Thanks a lot. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. We are closing here. Thank you.